Um, welcome to our uh, Kuma International Architecture Month. Today is the last lecture of the series. Um, so we are, um, it is seven o'clock here in Sarajevo and we welcome everyone who's here currently. We are expecting a few more people to join, uh, but regardless, I think it's time to start. Um, so thank you again for being with us. Uh, here we also have Claudia Zini, who is the founder and director of Kuma International. And we, with us is also our um, final guest, uh, Dr. Suzanne uh, Brent, uh, Harris Brent, sorry, Susie. Um, she's gonna be talking about um, the politics of landscape in the occupied West Bank. And this concludes our um, thematic uh, evening of um, reclaiming boundaries. Last week we had Aina Baba Ahmetovic speaking about um, diasporic practice, practices in Bosnia and Herzegovina. And uh, today we have Susie kind of concluding this subsection. And so before uh, I, I uh, tell a little bit more about Susie, I just wanted to take a minute and thank Claudia and Kuma for making some room um, in the wonderful Kuma International uh, program for architecture. Um, and it's been a great pleasure to be running this um, Architecture Month for the third time. Uh, this is our third annual uh, Architecture Month and we're hoping you know, that this becomes uh, a long running uh, event. And so also thank you all for being with us every time or for however many lectures you were able to join. We really appreciate it. Um, and just to let you know that all the lectures are being recorded and they are going to be available on our YouTube um, channel. So if you have missed something, you can always go back to Kuma International webpage and, um, and go and, and take a look at the lectures again. And so um, I'm just going to introduce our last speaker of the month. Um, it's Dr. Suzanne harris uh, who is an assistant professor of architecture and urbanism at Carleton University in Ottawa, Canada. Uh, Suzanne holds a PhD in Urban and Regional Studies from MIT and a Master's of Architecture from the University of Waterloo. Her research brings together design and social sciences to explore issues of power, equity, and collective identity in the built environment. Uh, topics she has explored um, across Eurasia and the occupied Palestinian territories. Um, she's also a licensed architect and has worked at design research practices across the globe. Uh, previously, she was an architect in residence with the Decolonizing Architecture Art Research in the Occupied West Bank. So Susie's personal research uh, expanded on this experience, uh, delving into the politics of landscape in rural areas of the West Bank. And it actually, her work received a Royal Architectural Institute of Canada medal and was featured in her co-curated exhibition, Landscape of Resistance, the Marshall Islands and the Occupied Palestinian Territories. In uh, 2017, she co-founded the Practice Collective Domain, uh, which focuses on spatial analysis, urban activism, architecture and media in the public interest. And so it's my great pleasure to welcome tonight uh, Dr. Suzanne harris brandt Susie, uh, thank you so much for being with us and uh, the floor is all yours. Thank you so much, Leila. Okay, let me uh, share screen. Can you see that all right? Yes, we can see it perfectly. Thank you. Perfect. So thank you so much to Leila and the Kuma team for inviting me to speak. Uh, I was really intrigued by this year's theme of living borders, since I think there's a lot to be gleaned from that discussion. And I've also really been enjoying uh, listening in on some of the other presentations whenever my time permits. So for me personally, this is also a great pleasure because I'm so happy to be back in discussion with Leila, whom I consider a longtime friend and someone that I got to know well while we were both architects and residents living in the West Bank. You know, that was a time for sharing ideas to better understand some of the region's spatial complexities. And many of our conversations did a lot to enhance my own understandings as a scholar. So I'm so happy that we now have this new opportunity to kind of continue in that direction today. Uh, this lecture has also given me a chance to revisit some of my earlier research on the ways we as designers are implicated in state power and politics, as well as some of the ways we might approach kind of reclaiming power and reshaping those uneven power dynamics. 
the majority of my current work examines these sorts of topics relative to a completely different geography, uh, that of the post-socialist uh, sphere of Eurasia, and particularly of the South Caucasus. And so I really appreciate this opportunity to kind of reflect back on their presence in Palestine and to revisit some of the origins of those themes in my research. Now, the work that I'm going to share with you today looks specifically at the politics of landscape in the West Bank. It looks at how landscape is used as a proxy for Israeli land annexation and territorial control. And it comes out of my time spent in the more rural village areas of the West Bank several years ago. And that was when I was an architect in residence with uh, decolonizing architecture. I spent several months based in the village of Batir, which is just south of Jerusalem. And then building off that experience, I conducted some of my own research into the politics of landscape, which was a part of my Master of Architecture thesis. And today there's an incredible body of scholarship on the impacts of architecture and urban development in shaping the course of Israeli settler colonialism, uh, only a few of which you can see here. And of course, considering the excellent work of the scholars we've been seeing at this year's Kuma International Architecture Month. And they've all shown just how significant the built environment is to local human rights and politics, and how we as designers are kind of implicated in that process. In an occupation so heavily shaped by architecture and urban development, you might be wondering why I focus on landscape. In fact, I'm going to show that the two are intimately connected. How, how much of what plays out in the kind of politics of urban development actually has its roots in and often secretly manifests through contestation around rural landscapes. And I'm gonna share some remarkable stories and sometimes surreal uh, stories about how landscape gets caught up in ideas of misdemeanor, things like violent trees and murdered flowers of seemingly innocuous natural elements that are transformed into these undercover political proxy agents and villains. And collectively, these stories speak to the all-encompassing complexity of the occupation. And it's, it's incredibly deep penetration into the inner workings of the West Bank's landscape. Despite being less recognized as an, as an Israeli apparatus for spatial control, the elements of the natural environment are in many ways kind of easily afforded to this. And this type of manipulation is something uh, that, that is built into their different qualities. In their silent yet spatially consuming forms, we frequently presume that they're politically neutral and passive. Uh, but as we're gonna see, they go back and forth between political use by Israelis and by Palestinians. And these landscape elements continue to become kind of both friend and foe. They're utilized as both a medium and an agent for power retention in the innumerable actors in this occupation. Uh, so for example, here we're seeing a Palestinian farmer looking out over his olive grove, which is often threatened by Israeli settlers. It's a situation where trees and their cultivation play a crucial role in territorial claims. And that's something that I'll get into a bit more in a second. So I'd argue that the hidden potential for dirt, trees, plants, insects to cause ripples in the geopolitical status of the West Bank shouldn't be underestimated. Uh, these elements have the capacity to carry highly complex socio-political narratives. And indeed, over the course of this conflict, they become parties to political change in both direct and indirect ways. Israel's ability to control the lands of the West Bank for future settlements have relied heavily on these environmental tactics. And the nature reserves become a place not only for conservation, but also prohibition, a place where Palestinian land purchase is forbidden, simple Palestinian residential construction is prevented, and even animal grazing is in violation of laws. Uh, likewise, cultivation laws not only regulate agriculture, they restrict economic competition and promote a dependency on outside imports. Uh, most significantly, landscape has been used as a tool for territorial appropriation, appropriation across the 1949 Armistice Green Line. And it does so by masking itself in simple land use planning regulation. Uh, so here you can see the Green Line relative to Israel and then enlarged encircling the West Bank. Uh, for those of you that attended some of the other great lectures, 
or already know the region well, uh, you're likely a bit familiar with this kind of tremendous spatial fragmentation of the West Bank. Uh, for others, uh, the West Bank has these several islands of jurisdictional control, and they range from those set up from the Oslo interim agreements to the settlement areas uh, to closed military areas, all of which I'm going to get into. One of the greatest contributors to this spatial fragmentation is those ABC divisions that came out of the Oslo Interim Agreements, uh, which were in the early to mid 1990s. And they divided the territory of the West Bank into these three primary jurisdictions. Now, uh, there were also further provisions for Hebron, but uh, we're not seeing those here. So, Area A, which you see in dark yellow, uh, is the most urban, and it was placed under Palestinian civil and uh, security control, uh, although it's important to note that the IDF still frequently has incursions into this area. Area B is a hybrid of Palestinian civil control and Israeli military control. And the area that I'm going to foreground is this one, Area C, uh, which is entirely under Israeli control and it also comprises the largest share of land in the West Bank at around 60%. It's the least built up area, which is also why I was interested in it for this idea of the kind of politics of landscape. And it's also the only spatially continuous of the three. So you can see it almost acting like a kind of ocean around those political islands of areas A and B. In many ways, then, we can say that area C is at the kind of epicenter of these territorial struggles in the occupation. Uh, and it's worth noting that uh, as of May 1999, the five-year interim period for those accords ended without reaching a new comprehensive peace agreement. So in theory, these divisions have actually expired. Uh, today, though, they are carrying on in a kind of de facto way, and they continue to have huge impacts on people's lives. And just to situate things, it's within Area C that the majority of Israeli-only settlements are being built, including control over their adjacent areas. And here you can see just how extensive that process of settler colonialism is. Um, despite the built-up areas being uh, rather small, uh, through their municipal boundaries and regional council areas, the settlements have power over a large amount of Area C. Uh, looking at the politics of landscape in this area, can then help us understand how this land becomes a place for future Israeli settlement expansion. And a lot of this hinges on the governance framework of the West Bank. So following the occupation in 1967, an Israeli regime of martial law was unilaterally imposed on those acquired areas. It was kind of the materialization of what a gamut has called a state of ex exception. It's where a seemingly provisional and exceptional measure is then transformed into a protracted technique of government. A complex legal structure of existing Jordanian, British mandatory, and Ottoman laws was used and then modified by Israeli military orders, which sanctioned any new regulations. Uh, within Area C, the new governance structure is therefore this really confusing composition of inherited laws. Some of them themselves have earlier inherited components, all of which is then modified by Israeli military orders, for which there are thousands. Uh, important for our purposes is the inheritance of the 1858 Ottoman Land Code. It impacts areas, various land use designations. And this land use uh, reform program was originally established, of course, under the Ottoman Empire long before the West Bank's occupation. It was used to define land types and land uses and required owners to register their property. The law served to kind of increase property tax revenue, impose potential military service on the owners, and to heighten Ottoman control in the region. The land uh, designation worth highlighting for our purposes today is that of Miri land or land slated for agricultural use. Uh, according to the 1858 land code, ownership of this land remained vested with the state while usage rights were afforded to individuals. Uh, but in practice, though, Miri land was basically indistinguishable from that with full ownership. So Miri rights could be sold, transferred, leased, divided, and even inherited. Uh, 
uh, mirror usage was secured through cultivation for a period of 10 consecutive years. Uh, crucially, failed cultivation for three or more years granted the Ottoman state the right to take its possession back and then to sell it to a, a potentially a new cultivator. Now, because of this continuation of the 1858 Ottoman land code, uh, Cultivation monitoring has become an Israeli state tactic for land seizure. It's one with a rather dubious grounding because Israel isn't actually the state per se, but rather just a contemporary occupier. Uh, after the occupation of the West Bank, this old law was like dug up and then the, its intentions were manipulated. So instead of taking the tax burden off people who weren't cultivating their land, it was used as a tool to seize huge parts of the West Bank's territory if cultivation wasn't deemed sufficient. The tracking, documenting, and verification of this land use is, is perhaps on a scale and intensity more extreme than anywhere else on Earth. Uh, using state-of-the-art satellite imagery, the lifespan and cultivation frequency of Palestinian land is being meticulously monitored. Uh, the collection and analysis of this data is being done by the Israeli Land Appeal Committee. But it's not being done for, say, uh, what we might assume traditional ecological reasons tied to things like global warming or plant cycles. But of course, it's being done for political reasons of territorial control. The newer and more sophisticated technologies are being used to ensure that this Miri land remains frozen in those 19th century Ottoman legacies. Uh, land usage that isn't in conformity with these tight regulations leaves it open to seizure, after which time it becomes redesignated as mahlul or dead land and placed under Israeli possession. And this subversion of the Ottoman land code began in 1979, and it was an extension of earlier efforts by Israel during the 60s and 70s to lay claim to what had previously been state land under Jordanian control. And so here you can see the former Jordanian registered state land on, uh, on the left, and uh, it made up about 12% of the West Bank. And then this was then joined by the seizure of private property of individual Palestinian absentees, uh, those deemed no longer in the West Bank, who were stripped of their personal ownership, and then their land was declared seized survey land, uh, here about 8% of the West Bank. But whereas that survey land scrutinized Palestinian ownership based on regional presence, the shift towards Miri land in the 1980s has meant that it's the land's chosen use that qualifies title. So put differently, you could be living on and using your Miri land, but if it's not cultivated in a very specific way, it's that threat of, the, of seizure. Now, overall, we can see here in Turquoise the tremendous seizure of West Bank land using this system of state land categorization. It's an overwhelming amount of area C and roughly 36% of the total West Bank for over 200,000 hectares. And one way that such Miri land becomes undesirable for cultivation uh, and at risk of Israeli seizure is through environmental degradation, and especially as a result of illegal waste dumping, uh, both in the form of sewage and solid waste. So you have a process where the contamination of land erodes its potential for cultivation, which in turn erodes Palestinian ownership and eventually sovereignty. So in other words, cultivation is at the heart of resistance against settler colonialism. And here you just get a quick sense of the risk of land contamination uh, due to raw sewage. So we see built up areas close to water sources, uh, many lacking fully effective wastewater infrastructure. But concerningly, 90 to 95% of Palestinian wastewater is untreated in the West Bank. Well and water uh, from tank samples conducted by the World Health Organization found that 22% exceeded bacteria standards for drinking water. Now, informal solid waste disposal in the landscape is also a huge concern. Now, this takes place both large and small scales uh, through official government landfills on occupied land, as well as through the dumping activities of individuals in West Bank communities, uh, like you're seeing here. Uh, 
those curious to see the geopolitical transformations of the Israeli-Palestinian conflict being played out relative to waste could make their way to the West Bank landfill of Kedumi. It's located in a former quarry near Nablus, and it's also close to the Israeli settlement with the same name of Kedumi. Now, on this map, you can see the dumps collection area from within Israel as well as from uh, the different West Bank settlements, which are shown in turquoise. Uh, here, de facto boundaries are being formulated and expanded through the disposal of load after load of Israeli waste, uh, arriving in the magnitude of 10,000 tons per month. Uh, as Israeli dump trucks arrive and leave behind their waste, they're actively contributing to a process of territorial seizure, which is incremental, creeping, and cumulative in nature. Each bag of waste signifies a further breach in international law, with occupied lands serving Israel at the expense of Palestinians. Now, the incentives for these sorts of dumps are economic, social, and political, but the result is a kind of territorial overtake now showing up uh, in new landfills across the region. So it's no longer just limited to the hilltop residential settlements. Now, part of this is because of following the imposition of the occupation, dumping waste in the West Bank has become this really lucrative business. At the landfill of uh, Kedemim alone, the facilities operating company can make profits in the magnitude of 17,000 US dollars per month. These dumping practices contribute to this larger process of West Bank land seizure, which operates as a kind of form of gradual creeping annexation. And with regard to Kedumim dump, an Israeli announcement first described the project as a nature preserving rehabilitation uh, meant to kickstart the preservation of the quarry. And it would be one involving only specific kinds of waste, like construction materials or shredded tires. But the project actually started to transform and gradually it turned into this full-fledged profit generating and kind of territory seizing endeavor with large amounts of settlers household garbage. Um, it's, it's operated by a private business and it's expected to yield millions in shekels in revenues over its lifetime. Now, the, this process of sovereign transformation at ketamine landfill occurs both physically and legally. So you have spoiled food, broken dishes, old furniture, and building supplies that were all once a part of Israel, now migrating into the occupied territory to serve as a kind of new settler colonial trash topography. At the dump, waste is quite literally serving as the foundation for new national boundaries. Israelis produced part of ketamine, transforming the occupied land in content, use, and ultimate jurisdiction. A similar yet smaller scale version of this process is playing out across West Bank rural villages and individual Miri land plots like you're seeing here. Waste is being dumped onto individual village members' property, uh, at times by Israeli settlers who want to avoid those disposal fees. Here's another example from the village of Batir. Now, part of the problem is inadequate existing solid waste infrastructure. So here you're seeing just one example of the journey that waste has to make by truck. Uh, this is from the village of Batir where I was staying to a landfill further south in Yata. Now, along the way, it gets held up at various checkpoints, which can make collection uh, more unpredictable. And according to a report by the Applied Research Institute Jerusalem, approximately 60% of the waste currently leaving Batir households is organic. Uh, like you can see in this diagram, this opens up some interesting opportunities for reconceiving things. And so what would it mean for us as architects to think about designing a new landscape for local organic waste management? Instead of being dumped onto those at-risk Miri land plots, perhaps it could be selectively done on state land kind of priming it for recultivation. This could address not only a waste issue, but also that sense of eroding Palestinian sovereignty. And this was just one of the ideas that I was interested in exploring during my research, thinking about designer agency through landscape. If such organic waste could be separated and then managed locally, then more space would be available for non-organic waste in the village's storage dumpsters and collection trucks. 
Uh, this would prevent overflow and even reduce the number of visits to the dump. And the ripple effects could span further. So they could impact everything from savings in village council dollars to a reduction in the amount of waste related traffic congesting roads and checkpoints. Uh, so there's great opportunity for us as designers to contemplate these sorts of activities. Next, I'll take you through some examples of how, perhaps contrary to first impressions, the preservation of nature, just as much as the degradation, like we just saw, connects to this idea of territorial seizure under occupation. Uh, here in light blue, you can see the significant portion of Area C designated as nature reserves. So there's 50 such Israeli designated nature reserves in the West Bank, 36 or 83 percent of which fall into Israeli controlled Area C. Put differently, 14% of West Bank land is confined to nature reserves. Uh, unlike the intentions in other contexts of nature reserves to just simply protect nature, in this absence of sovereignty, these areas have the political purpose of safeguarding unpopulated lands away from Palestinian use. Only the residents that were previously living in these reserves are allowed to remain there, and even they are subject to many restrictions. And so accordingly, the West Bank's nature reserves become these kind of further islands of controlled territory. And we can see that beyond the reserve's goals of wildlife protection, uh, there's these kind of greater ideas of land annexation, uh, particularly considering that many of these uh, reserves are already operated by the Israeli Nature Reserves Authority. Uh, and indeed, last October 2020, several news outlets, including the Middle Eastern Monitor, reported on how 36 nature reserves were being slated for the construction of Jewish settlements and military camps. And this latter category of military camps connects to how the restrictions and usage of nature reserves is often unclear and contradictory. We don't typically imagine a nature reserve doubling as a kind of military training area. And this coupling is actually not new. So in many instances, and particularly throughout the Jordan Valley, the land of nature reserves substantially overlaps with IDF military training areas. So here you can see the nature reserves in blue, and then overlapping that is uh, military training areas in gray. Now, overall, that, that makes it kind of um, doubtful that these environmental protection areas uh, are really the focus uh, of the designation of nature preserves. So there's this cycle of land seizure through nature reserve designation, all in support of expanding Israeli settler uh, colonialism. And unfortunately, at this point, uh, these aren't even tacit tactics anymore. Uh, when announcing the creation of seven new nature reserves and the expansion of 12 others this past January 2020, Israeli Defense Minister Naftali Bennett said, today we provide a big boost for the land of Israel and continue to develop the Jewish communities in Area C with actions, not words. I invite all the citizens of Israel to tour and walk the land to continue the Zionist enterprise. And included in these seized lands were privately owned Palestinian land and a Bedouin community that lives on the land will effectively be barred from any building. Now, the result is similar to what you see here, Israeli-only settlements being constructed on the rural hillsides of Area C. And the impacts are twofold in that there's not only this loss of territory, but that that loss then results in fewer grazing and cultivating areas for Palestinian farmers. So the remaining areas are then at risk of overgrazing, and they can be located quite far away from village communities. Restricting Palestinian access to land in the West Bank through nature reserves is actually just one category of closed area. And so here you can see the many others with uh, nature reserves in the middle at about 10% of the total. And those numerous closed areas come together to look like this in blue. Uh, as you can see, they consume the vast majority of Area C, laying claim to much of the West Bank's unbuilt territory. Now, the preservation of landscape also has implications that go beyond the boundaries of nature reserves. And so, for example, on a March afternoon several years ago, three Palestinians were detained in the Jordan Valley 
Under the rising spring heat, they had been caught committing a crime. Held up as evidence by the Israeli soldiers was this plant, Bundelia turniforti, or akum. It's a native thistle plant commonly used in springtime Palestinian cuisine. And it's only suitable for consumption when the kind of fresh buds uh, bloom, which is between February and March. So it can be assumed that these suspects had been found kind of purposefully uprooting the plant in order to dine on it. And the accused were uh, finally released after several hours and their case was referred to the Israeli Nature and Parks Authority. It's a kind of uh, innocuous plant and it doesn't really stand out across the landscape. And so uh, later they raised this kind of humorous speculation of why the IDF soldiers were able to identify this mistreatment, um, whether they were amateur botanists or if the IDF had kind of prioritized plant sensitivity seminars alongside intensive combat training. But despite this plant having long standing use in both traditional Palestinian culinary recipes and medicine, a 1960s campaign launched by the Israeli Nature Reserves Authority and the Israeli Society for the Protection of Nature placed it and dozens of others on a protected list, preventing their picking within Israeli controlled territory. And beyond the kind of ludicrousness of that situation, it pointed toward deeper truths about life under occupation. And the implication of Palestinians having violated an Israeli law brought to the fore these much greater questions regarding the jurisdictional scope of the occupied territories. And it serves as an example of how Palestinians remain subject to Israeli rule without receiving any of the rights or protection associated with citizenship. Now, the planting of trees is also incredibly politicized in the West Bank. So the long duration of this occupation has really made it so that every aspect of life is engulfed in these sorts of politics to the point where even one tree species can signal a more legitimate tie to an area over another. Uh, as a result of several military orders, the cultivation of fruit trees became subject to Israeli military uh, approval. Uh, although it's not always enforced, failure to get this approval is subject to fines, imprisonment, and crop demolition. In order for a Palestinian landowner to be recognized by the Israeli Lands Appeal Committee, their cultivation must be visible and continuous. And this has meant that not all forms of cultivation are equal. So trees are often preferred since their growth is continuous throughout all the seasons and they're really easy to see on the landscape. And this has played a role in ensuring the dominance of certain monospecies. Uh, it's tied to greater practices of securing territory through tree planting which has been going on for generations. So at its core, there's this kind of spatial arms race deduced between Palestinian olive and Israeli pine trees. Pine trees are associated with Israeli forest preserves, whereas olive trees are associated with Palestinian agriculture. And these tree planting wars are now being played out in the West Bank on the level of, kind of increased complexity. The pine tree has become this proxy watchman guarding against Palestinian land use until it can be slated for settlement expansion. Now we can say that using native plant species takes on a whole new complex meaning under occupation. And this is due to the embedded correlations between the authenticity of the plants and the authenticity of the people who inhabit the land and grow them. And because of this, the power of using natural elements as weapons that comes through in their kind of blurring of responsibility. Uh, it's unclear at what point the responsibility is assigned to us as humans for giving these landscapes such deep political significance. Uh, as designers, we need to not only be familiar with plants' legal restraints there, but also foresee their kind of land controlling opportunities. Uh, there are also, of course, further long term environmental impacts. Uh, this near monocultural landscape makes the West Bank's agricultural crops more susceptible to epidemics. The olive tree is especially vulnerable to infestations of olive flies and this uh, fungal disease called peacock eye. And these vulnerabilities are at their highest in areas where people can't afford pesticides or they're not easily accessible. And over time, this is just resulting in a reduction in plant species which leads to a kind of decrease in uh, the regional's biodiversity. Uh, 
Uh, reflecting back on our role in agency as designers and all of this, we can see that there's this great potential for us to seize upon plant human alliances and the local politics of landscape to sort of subvert the laws of military occupation. And an aspect of my work started to just explore in that direction. So I, the following images are some that I created as a type of kind of provocative uh, speculative paper architecture, primarily intended to start conversations. Uh, but many of the ideas are actually still within the realm of the possible. So they point towards the kind of incredible potential of plants in the occupation, uh, which I think is one area that's been far less discussed in the powers of design in the region. And the designs that I put forward aim to kind of act as an arena of speculation into subversive avenues, uh, the ways in which we as urban designers or architects could start to adjust the occupation's unequal power relations. Uh, so, for example, what if the tremendous amounts of lands confined in those closed military zones uh, could actually be planted with that list of protected Israeli wildflowers? Uh, these could then be used as feeding grounds for things like bees that would then connect back to areas A and B. Is that considered restricted cultivation? I began charting out which protected species would be most appropriate by West Bank region. And these are the sorts of closed military locations that could be targeted for this kind of activation. The settlement surroundings, the bypass road buffer zones, and the separation barriers seam areas. Zooming in, we can see what this would look like for several communities where the apiaries in the yellow islands of A and B could be feeding in the closed settlement areas shown in turquoise. And there's this intentional degree of kind of surrealness and absurdity to the work. It shows how Israel could be caught up in its own legal opacity. In the future, for example, we could imagine the IDF issuing a new military order restricting bees from flying or the spending of Israeli tax dollars to undertake a mass culling of the country's own protected wildflowers. And a final image where the simultaneous blooming of thousands of these wildflowers in closed regions produces a kind of highly visible landscape register, the one exposing the areas impacted by these land controls. In the fields and rings of closed areas, these blooming red anemones could remind, or, uh, could remind us of the invisible landscapes and justices and make them once again profoundly visible. Uh, so I'll stop there and we can hopefully open it up a bit for more of a discussion. Thank you so much for your attention. Thank you, Susie. Thank you for sharing your research um, with us. Now, if anyone has a question, please feel free to raise your hand or if you're a bit shy to turn the camera on, you can also type, type it in the chat and I can read it out for us. Um, and then in the meantime, maybe i can start i didn't see any questions yet um it's not really a question but maybe it's a comment susie i remember when we were in in palestine for that uh for, for our art architect in residence um the art program and at one point we went to visit a bedouin and i'm not really sure in which part it was now it, it's a bit hazy but um, he was saying how he's been there for many generations and they are basically farmers and they at that point they had the, the, the Israeli military had come in and taken down their it was it was a tent kind of a temporary shelter building for the I don't know how many times 12 13 20th time um, and then right next to his land there was a road that was dividing, uh, let's say, the agricultural land from the settlement. And right across the street, there were these really lush houses with really like green gardens. Um, and there was plenty of water and even like um, swimming pools. While he was struggling, he was saying that they didn't have any water because um, the source of water was cut off and he had to go through checkpoints and they were open only on Wednesdays and even on Wednesdays it was questionable whether like he would be able to get through the water source, source or not and then at that point um, I, that was the first time I really thought about this idea of landscape kind of acting both as kind of it, it reflected this huge like imbalance in, in, in power and in access to basic utilities like water 
um, and also like it, it was just so obvious for the first time to me. And so it's not really a comment, but it ties back to this idea of, of landscape uh, kind of as a military tactic. And um, I, I don't know, like because you have you have now shifted also your research um, to other parts of the world. Do you think, or do you see any parallels, um, maybe elsewhere, that kind of similar techniques of the appropriation of landscape as kind of a military tool has taken place? Yeah, that's that's a great question, and I think you summarized it. And it actually reflects a bit uh, my own research path when I was. Uh, you know, I, I am an architect by training. And when I was in the West Bank, I had this vision of the urban. I was focused on understanding everything urban. I wanted to understand every aspect of what made this spatially complex conflict uh, tied to built form, tied to architecture, tied to urban design, um, urban planning regulations, all of that. And I think I naively also thought, okay, that's the landscape. That's um, that's for uh, those studying agriculture, ecologists, um, but that's, that's not what a design professional should be fascinated by. And then slowly, as I started to unpack the legislations and understand different things, and being based in Batir helps a lot too, because you can start to see it. You start to realize there's very different um, issues at stake. So in the settlements, in the built up areas of area A, there, there are other issues. There are many politicized ways in which architecture and urban development are, are tying into the conflict. And uh, of course, as I showed at the beginning, many scholars looking at that in incredible detail. Uh, but the area that's the most uncertain uh, uh, leading up into any future uh, resolution uh, or peace deal are the unbuilt areas, which are all in area C. And so I started to say like, well, that's also the most potential in some ways to think about uh, the way that sovereignty will play out in different contexts. So I became very curious and, and kind of surprised myself to find out how, just how deeply politicized landscape was on, on every level, every level. Uh, and I, I think the Jewish National Fund's uh, afforestation campaigns are probably fairly well known, particularly uh, to many Jews living in diaspora. Uh, Jews in Canada that, that would be a part of the campaigns that were done to fundraise money for that. There's also, I think, uh, some fascinating work that's been done uh, by the professor of law, Iris Braverman at um, uh, U Buffalo, I believe. I have to double check where she's still based. But she studied how the Jewish National Fund did all of this fundraising and one of the key scholars who's looked at these tree wars and the idea of politicizing the landscape. So it slowly just started to present itself to me and I became more and more fascinated with why this was the case and how it was playing out. Um, I think it's, uh, it's one of those things that once you see it somewhere, you can't not see it everywhere. <laughs> I think there are, uh, uh, landscape is politicized in many, many, many different contexts. And um, anytime you have something that's tied to state regulation, it's gonna start to play out in different ways. Uh, so you have uh, great works that have just come to the top of my mind uh, of other scholars like James Scott seeing like a state where he discusses uh, the regulation of landscape uh, through forest reserves. Um, a colleague of mine in Georgia, Ketty Gricciani, is just doing some fascinating research looking at uh, the regulation and planting of trees for territorial control there. Uh, there it's uh, quite a different process where in the west of Georgia, um, people would plant trees so that they could say that, that yes, this is indeed our property, when the, so that the Soviet state wouldn't take it away. Um, but there wasn't the same level of state uh, operation and kind of militaristic control of the territory. Uh, but just recently, I found out uh, when her and I were talking about this work that there were these kind of connections there. But I, I think there's, there's so much uh, to be considered and gleaned from this understanding of how landscape becomes uh, politicized and, and what it's what it can mean as a precursor for development. I think that's for me one of the most interesting parts in the West Bank is how it does then become the, the kind of core foundational establishment for how settlements are, are taking place and the, the next level, which is the urban realm where we all started our interest. Thank you, Susie.
Um, I, we have a question from the audience. Sabina has raised her hand up. So Sabina, feel free to ask your question. So I'm muted. Oh yeah. Hi Leila. Hello. <laughs> I'm, I tried to follow every lecture. I was a little bit late today, but um, uh, hi Susan. Thank you so much for your for your talk. I really appreciate how you um, communicated the the whole landscape uh, politicization in um, in in this context. So I was just wondering. Maybe you explained this already in the beginning, but I, um, I'm curious how your um the images you showed last of your own uh, proposals your own imagine yeah imagination let's say of possibilities you see there um can you do you use it um for uh, some kind of activism or concretely there in the field with people or i don't know uh, can you use them somehow as a weapon or as a tool uh, because you said the, the idea is that they should start the conversation so i'm just curious about how concretely you already have or plan to use them? Yeah, that's a great question. Uh, for me, uh, originally, the work was tied to my Master of Architecture thesis. So I produced it in that realm. And it was kind of meant to circulate in some of the different uh, scholarly realms of people interested in these topics. I also put it in an exhibition, which was paired with um, a colleague of mine, Chris Knight's work, looking at the Marshall Islands. So it's very, uh, maybe this also links to Leila's question earlier, like, do you start to see these things in other contexts? So him and I ended up seeing that it was kind of very different, completely different landscape, um, one much more aquatic based in his instance, but that politics plays into it and that the state is also uh, using a landscape as a tool of manipulation. Uh, and then beyond that, they've just been uh, in various online forums or publications. I, I admit that I would love to kind of carry that work further more so. Uh, people have asked me previously if I would go and actually kind of do this and test it. And, and I don't know, I, I think that, that could, there could be some potential there. I think what I liked about some of them is that the point of them is to point to that um, the absurdity of this all if you push it all to the next level you can start to see the unraveling or you you just underscore how absurd some of these tactics is uh, when i was discussing with my thesis committee uh, with the best intentions many of them would say things like oh but can't we just make it a nicer space or can we improve this environment why maybe we can build something and hope that it doesn't get demolished and that just wasn't going to work for me because I, I think you, you can do that, but it, it's somehow not addressing the deeper uh, underlying levels of, of, of power uh, imbalance in the region. And so I wanted designs that if you could say like, what then? So you build it or you design it and then it, it's slated for demolition, what then? And that through that process, it's actually more elucidating to think, think through uh, what could happen. So in the case, of say um seed bombing all their protected wildflowers if they come and demolish them because you weren't allowed to plant them you can say you know the israeli government has just spent millions of dollars demolishing their own protected wildflowers um in another design i didn't show here there was this idea of reusing uh the rubble from uh, demolition sites as a kind of landscape filtration for sewage water and again you can start to say so if they come to demolish it what what's happening there the demolishing demolition rubble and this is where the resources are going so i think for me there was always a kind of uh, there was meant to be this absurdity but also kind of dead seriousness about that absurdity because that absurdity exists in all of these regulations right like the the existing regulations for plant species and trees and everything about it that getting arrested for picking a thistle all of this is already there in the landscape uh, but i think there's great potential and i'd love I, I that's why i liked this talk i kind of am coming back and revisiting some of this work that i haven't looked at uh, for a couple of years uh, you know i i set it aside as i expanded my knowledge base to slightly different contexts but i never intended uh, for it to fully slip away so i love the idea that maybe it is about time to revisit some of this stuff and uh, i appreciate kuma giving me this chance yeah. to kind of discuss it with all of you in the audience as well yeah no i think it's great I, I, you said i think perfectly i mean this there definitely is a huge potential um and i hope that your work will get more publicity 
um because there's really this activism and it's like provoking of critical thinking and you know just displaying the absurdity of the whole uh um, the, um context of this uh, regulation of landscape in general the occupation and uh, for me um i think as a tool also and for example uh, is really powerful and uh, I, um, I like the work also of joe secco i don't know if you read the palestine and the, the, uh, because it's based in um also in in research and you know it has this kind of a scientific approach it's not just uh, your vision um you come from uh, uh, um, you know the, the the you come from research uh, and you kind of um, your tool is really direct um, the images you show the collages you show I think they can have really a lot of effect so so this was just something I was thinking about thank you for your comment and I hope you will continue with this thanks uh, so much Sabina thank you Thanks, Sabina, for your question. Uh, do we have any more questions from the audience? I see um, a camera on. Uh, I, I think Noah has a question. Yes, Noah, thank you for being with us. Please, the floor is yours. Noah, can you hear us? We have a, your oh, mic is sorry. off. Sorry, you mean me? Yes. Hi. Uh, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you somewhat. Hi. Can you hear me? Okay. Um, I'm just curious. Though, I'm actually. I happen to be. Um, I'm happen to be uh, interested in the same subject matter right now in painting. Um, have you? Um, have you come across any visual artists who have um, kind of reflected this? Uh, the issue with a politicized landscape in the West Bank. Um, coming so uh, off Sabina's comment of Joe Sacco's graphic novel of uh, Palestine, but also uh, Samir Harb has done some amazing uh, graphic design work. Uh, he was based at Goldsmith, but you could look up his work. Um, I haven't. I'll admit I haven't followed artists to the same visual artists to the same degree. Um, but maybe that's something I can give a bit of thought to and uh, send a note your way if something else comes up. Yeah, it's, it'd be great to hear a little bit about how, how are you finding that research? Is it is there a good amount on that topic? Um, no, I feel like it's just surfacing now, actually, for a lot of Israelis. Um, it wasn't something uh, that was discussed at all. Um, and the same way the, you know, the design and the architecture um, was camouflaging the, the history of the occupation and um, and the Palestinian history in the landscape. Uh, it was part of um, an overall effort of the Israeli government um, in schools and, uh, you know, in any, any cultural um, venue, basically. So um, growing up in Israel, you wouldn't really know anything about it, even though it was right in front of your eyes. So I feel like um, the absurdity was very, I'm sorry about the noise. I'm, I'm, it's the middle of the day in New York and I'm at work. Um, so the absurdity was very um, stark and, uh, but we had no tools of approaching it because we were just uh, shown this landscape as a natural landscape and the ruins as the ruins from times past, you know, or the, you know, the rubble from any period could be, you know, it's not explained. So um, as a landscape painter, I find that really fascinating to document exactly that, like just, it's just um, there, you know, and it's so, so layered and complicated, but it's also very simply present right yeah. there in front of you so that's what i'm absolutely i'll put in the chat a, a couple things <laughs> yes. that i mentioned in the and i'll put samir's uh, a piece by samir that's come out recently in parse journal and those Please. are a couple of the books that look more at landscape than art per se but maybe they're good starting points i think there is actually a exhibition coming up in uh, tel aviv museum about this uh, which is the first 
time I've ever heard of any Israeli museum, um, like such a mainstream Israeli museum, putting an exhibition about um, this uh, type of architectural research of the occupied territories. So that should be interesting. Yeah. I don't know when we're going to open this to that happening. What's that? Enrico has a suggestion for you as well. He's suggesting that you look at work of Orula Halawani, Palestinian photographer. Yeah, that's a great suggestion. Thank you so much. Welcome. Thanks for the question, Noah. Thank you, Noah, for being with us for all the way from New York. Um, great. So we have another question from Sanya. Sanya, please feel free to join us. Hi. Hi. This was very interesting, also very emotional for me. Uh, so I have a couple of questions, I think. First is like how you dealt with your emotional levels when working on this project, because you see injustice on like, um, you, you saw injustice on, on daily basis and how did you approach um, yeah, this personal contact also with, with, with the people, maybe also Leila, this is a, a question addressed also to you because from what I understood you did um, the residency at the same time more or less. And then I've also found very interesting that um, Noah spoke now. Um, and kind of pictured this other um side of the story of also not knowing or not having enough information to to begin with so my second question to you uh susie is um how how because you are playing this third part this neutral mm -hmm. part kind of right uh someone who is coming from the european context uh sorry um uh, north american context um but um uh, I think one always has to be a bit more careful when, when you go to these very specific places in, in the globe. So how did you perceive like when talking with local people, not only with the Palestinians, but also with the Israeli, like what kind of stories did you get and did that also influence your research uh, on it? And third thing is uh, what I see a lot in your work is also the level of, um, of the activism and like uh, how did, for, I don't know, did you speak with any of the Palestinian people to do this stuff? Like how, how did they react? Because as I understood your work was mostly in this academic field but it also has a lot i mean when you when when you talk about like how how to trick the system my first thought was oh this susie is a very naughty naughty girl um but in a very good way like uh because we we live like the systems we live in are naughty in itself in the sense they they we we constantly have to be very um concentrated not to get tricked so you you are dealing I, I have the feeling that you are dealing within your project the same way the system is is dealing with their own agenda and i find that very um as a good thing as something that that maybe can turn some things around yeah and thank you for the presentation no, that's great. Thanks, Sonia. Uh, lots of food for thought in there. I think, I think as you were speaking, there are a couple strands that I was starting to see come together uh, have to do with sort of um, the, my positionality, the research that I conducted, and, and how I've come to know things. Um, trying to decide if I should go sequentially or the best way. I would say uh, I'll start with your. I'll, I'll go in reverse order then. So the how how did I kind of approach this as a foreigner and and thinking about this and <coughs> sorry one sec. I think traditionally I did see that as a detriment. I saw myself as, as someone coming in that didn't have a personal vested interest in this other than kind of my my own strong desire to learn. I'm not Palestinian or Israeli. 
Uh, and I was surprised actually in some of the other talks, people say it's a detriment if you're from the region, you're assumed to be biased, you're assumed to be on one side or the other if you're Palestinian or Israeli. So maybe in hindsight, there is something about this kind of, uh, I, I didn't go in with any intention to, to say be against the occupation, which came out of studying how horrendous its implications are and the tools surrounding it. Um, so that, that was something that I didn't have a preconception of going into it. But I, I was also a bit timid at first. And I remember speaking. So I, I was an architect in residence twice. The second time was with Leila. And that was in a slightly more urban context. So we were in Betsahur. Um, but the first time I remember speaking with Alessandro Petty and kind of saying, I'm, I'm not sure. I don't know. What it, and, and he said, yes, that makes sense. And I'm paraphrasing. So uh, don't quote him on this. But uh, something along the lines of like, but as a foreigner, your, your naivete and your kind of fresh eyes will see things in a way that maybe other people have become hardened to or will overlook or take as to, uh, as just a, a part of everyday life and for granted. And so I've always, I think, tried to do that in my research too, to see something that maybe stood out to me as remarkable and ask why, even if it was in a very naive way, uh, to just start to question things with earnest and be like, uh, many and there were many things I, I actually think um i was appalled and probably more outspoken than i should have been by things uh that other people had somehow just started to my local friends had started to just resign like that's the way it is checkpoints have really long lineups that's the way it is uh, this happens like this that's the way it is and it's incredibly frustrating but learning about it for the first time um, does have that ability to think in this kind of critical way where you you ask questions that maybe others don't if they've spent uh, more time there. Um, in, in line with kind of uh, how did I get to know the different audiences locally, uh, uh, the majority of my time was spent in the West Bank, although I did spend some time uh, within 48 in, in Tel Aviv and Jerusalem and got to know some people there. And I, I don't know, I, I was uh, very surprised to see the difference in knowledge about some of these things. I, I think it depends a lot on your who you're surrounded with. And I didn't spend enough time to know, uh, say a kind of critical sample of people's opinions on this research. That would be a great for future area to really dive into and properly engage on a longer term with some of the members of the community. Uh, but even, uh, tying it back to my connection to being a North American, I, I enjoyed the discussions I've had with Jewish friends about uh, their understanding as a kind of um, diasporic Jew on things, particularly surrounding the Jewish National Fund's uh, fundraising for tree planting initiatives, where uh, many students were given the kind of blue box to donate coins the same way uh, some of us in North American were given UNESCO boxes to collect coins on Halloween. Uh, so this idea of a kind of community-based fundraising and this a direct correlation to the, the child or the person doing the fundraising in North America and you will plant a tree, like you are helping to, to make this country better. So this huge propaganda network uh, surrounding the Jewish National Fund's uh, operations. So hearing about that from some of my Canadian Jewish friends was really fascinating and allowed me to kind of think about their perspectives on things and, and how uh, sometimes information isn't really explicitly made available to people, uh, particularly those living in diaspora. Uh, and then how do I deal with the emotional levels of, of this work? I think that's an excellent question. And I think as designers, we have this tendency to always want to make things nicer, right? Like, I mean, that's kind of the point. You, you, You'd be an odd architect if you wanted to make things worse all the time. But the in, in intrinsic in the, the propositional forward looking aspects of design is that you're supposed to be creating a vision of improvement. This is the current situation and we're going to improve it. And, and like I was saying previously, that often meant this kind of like make it nice, make it pretty, make it happy. And that, that was really uncomfortable for me. And so I think the way that I dealt with those emotional levels is to instead just not make it nice, sit with it, sit with those thoughts, spend some time really thinking about what's going on and, and what the implications are and, and how designers are tying into it in different ways. And so maybe that's part of it is that like there isn't a quick 
nice solution. That's not the kind of like things get fixed and then um, you know the movie credits roll down and everything's happy. I, I think it's a different one where we do have to we have to sit and think about what this means to each of us, but also collectively. This is, this is a horrible occupation and it has incredible impacts on people's lives. And so as a designer, that took a little bit of unlearning, of moving away from that previous approach of always making nice, I guess. Yeah, thanks so much for the question, Sanya. Thank you for the question, Sanya. Maybe just to add to it, because you were asking my uh, opinion as well. Um, so I just have to underline that, uh, like Susie was saying, her experience is um, a bit more in depth um, in terms of the research in Palestine. I was there for a month. Um, and in terms of this emotional, uh, let's say, um, aspect, um, I found myself very frustrated by the injustice. And I found myself very kind of um, it, it, it powerless in a certain way because I couldn't see how things could be like changed, especially from my perspective. And like I had this luxury of coming and going as I pleased and then the freedom of movement. Um, but at the same time, I was very surprised and shocked by, um, I don't know what to call it, maybe resilience is the best word, by the resilience of the Palestinian people and their kind of way of coping with things. And there was just no room for, let's say, um, uh, sad or, or let's say pitying or, or kind of crying over spilled milk. It's, it's, it's a matter of how you deal with it and how do you, how do you move on to the next steps? And that, this was my, this is my experience. Maybe Susie has a different um, experience. So in that sense, that helped that emotional aspect because it's more focused on, okay, how do you get through the day? There's no water, there's no hot water. So how, when is it coming and, and so forth and so forth. You kind of focus on how to make it work rather than focusing on what's not um, working and pining over it. So, but again, like I have one month experience in Palestine and Susie has spent a lot more uh, time in the field and a lot, she's invested a lot more, more time uh, researching the topics. So maybe this is again, an outsider perspective of someone who's, who's kind of very briefly experienced this reality, which is difficult and, and which is not really easy to navigate at all. Uh, despite being a foreigner and having certain, uh, let's say, luxuries that the locals don't. So I hope that answers the question. Thank you. Thank for you very much. Um, and if we don't, do we have any more questions? I don't see any more questions in the chat. So Susie has left those references for anyone who might be interested. Um, and Enrico also has put in Rula's um, name on the site, so feel free to look that up. And so if there are no more questions, um, I would like to conclude uh, the last talk and the last session of our Architecture Month 2021 Living Borders. Uh, Susie, it's been so nice to see you. Um, I really do hope that you get a chance to come and visit us in Sarajevo and perhaps your research can expand to these parts of the world as well. Um, and um, thank you for your wonderful presentation as always. Um, and um, I think uh, next time we see each other, hopefully it's going to be in person and live. Yes, thank you so much, Leila. Thank you everyone in the audience for attending and a huge congrats to Claudia and Leila for this uh, incredibly successful Kuma International Architecture Month. I've really enjoyed seeing so many of the talks and I think I'll refer back to the recordings uh, quite frequently. So thank you for putting this together and for inviting me to participate. It's been a real pleasure. Thank you so much. Claudia, did you want to say something as well as you? Yes, I would like to thank Susie uh, for the wonderful talk. I would like also, I'm really, I'm actually quite sad <laughs> right now because I realize this beautiful architecture month has been going uh, so fast and it's already ending uh, today. Uh, but I'm really grateful to Susie, to all the audience, to all the people that have been joining us during this month. And of course, uh, the biggest gratitude goes to Leila, who is a colleague and a friend. And uh, again, for the third year in a row, she put together an amazing um, program. So uh, Leila, thank you so much because it would be no uh, 
uh, Kuma architecture program without you and I'm really grateful. And I think it's been an amazing journey so far. Uh, hopefully we have many years ahead with different uh, topics and so many interesting things to explore together. But again, yes, thanks to Suzanne and all the other uh, speakers that join us during this beautiful journey. Sabina was one of the speakers and she's still in the audience, I think. Yes, so Sabina, thank you. But really, I <laughs> thank you also to all the people that have been uh, decided to spend um, this time with us. I'm, I'm really grateful to everybody. Thank you. thank you for the continuous support, of course, without Without Kuma, without Chuna, this would be possible. And again, thank you to the speakers and the audience. And see you guys next year. Join us again. Bye, everyone. Have a great Bye, day. Everyone.